At flipsidegaming.com you can use the promo code LVD to get a 10% discount on orders over $10, and now you also get automatically entered into the Richard Kane Ferguson Playmat giveaway. Hello and welcome to another Magic Arena gameplay video. Today we're taking a look at the Aristocrat archetype updated with War of the Spark, and I've got two different builds here. I've got a Black White version and then a Mardu version with Judith. First off, let's take a look at the Black White list here. Of course, a big addition from War of the Spark was Cruel Celebrant, but we got some other additions as well. So the Aristocrat archetype in general is this creature-focused deck that has all these various sacrifice synergies built in and generates a bit of value through sacrificing creatures. So let's take a look at the entire list here, starting out with our 1-drops, where we've got the full 4 copies of Hunted Witness, nice 1 mana 1-1, one, one, that when it dies leaves behind a 1-1 one, one lifelinking token, so we've got more sacrifice fodder. We also have the full play set of Gutter Bones, is nice 2-1, that can return from the graveyard if our opponent lost life if we pay 2. And then we've got 2 copies of Spark Harvest, which I put in the 1-drop slot, since we can sacrifice a creature as an additional cost to destroy a creature or planeswalker from the opponent. And there's plenty of sacrifice fodder for us to use the Spark Harvest in this deck. Then at 2 mana, I've got the full 4 copies of Dusk Legion Zealot. This is one of the differences with the Mardu version and the Black-White version. In the Black-White version we have Dusk Legion Zealot, whereas in the Mardu version we have Hero of Precinct 1, because we have more multicolor creatures to leverage it. And then we've got the full 4 copies of Priest of Forgotten Gods, which shines against opposing creature decks, since we need to sacrifice 2 other creatures in order to make the opponent sacrifice a creature, lose 2 life, and we also get to draw a card and make double black mana, which we can then use to deploy more stuff out. But oftentimes we'll have some uh, benefits to sacrificing our creatures, so we're not just sacrificing two creatures for this effect, but often getting a bunch of other advantages as well. And then we've got the full four copies of Cruel Celebrant, which is the big new addition from War of the Spark. Two mana for a 1-2 that says whenever Cruel Celebrant or another creature or planeswalker we control dies, each opponent loses one life and we gain one life. So just having a bit of sacrifice fodder in play, a Cruel Celebrant or two, and then a way to sacrifice those creatures can lead to a lot of damage out of nowhere, and also gains us a bit of life, which we can then use to draw more cards through cards like Midnight Reaper, for example. And then we also have two copies of Pitiless Pontiff as another sacrifice outlet to go alongside our Priest of Forgotten Gods, and can also lead to those combo kills out of nowhere if we just have a board state with one or two Celebrants and a bunch of Sacrifice Fodder. We can just spend a bit of mana sacrificing those creatures to the Pontiff, and then uh, trigger all the Celebrants to drain out our opponent, and otherwise the Pontiff is just a good creature by itself to mana for a 2-2 that can become indestructible and gain Death Touch if we sacrifice a creature, so a nightmare to deal with for opposing creature decks. Then at 3 mana we've got the full play set of Midnight Reaper, which is our main card draw engine in the deck, because whenever a non-token creature we control dies, the Reaper deals 1 damage to us and we get to draw a card. So now with the addition of Cruel Celebrant gaining us a bunch of life, running all these copies of Midnight Reaper is less of a liability, since we can offset the life loss from the Reaper with the life gain from the Celebrant, and then the Reaper's gonna draw us a ton of cards. And then we also have two copies of Mortify to destroy a creature or enchantment at instant speed. And then at 4 mana we've got another new addition from War of the Spark in Sorin. Gives our creatures and planeswalkers lifelink during our turn. And then the plus 2 deals 1 damage to a player or planeswalker, which of course also gains us 1 life since Sorin has lifelink. And then the minus X can return a creature with convert mana cost X from our graveyard straight to the battlefield. So we can get back our key combo pieces like the Reaper, the Celebrant or maybe the Priest. And then another 4-drop we have is Taisa, which also plays very well in this deck, especially with the addition of Cruel Celebrant, because if a creature dying causes a triggered ability of a permanent we control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time, so it will double the triggers from Cruel Celebrant, it will double the triggers from Midnight Reaper, drawing us two cards instead of just one, it also doubles the triggers of Hunted Witness, making two soldier tokens instead of just one, and also plays very well with the Afterlife on Seraph, because if the Seraph dies, we now get four spirit tokens instead of just two, and creature tokens we control have Vigilance and Lifelink, which mainly plays well with the Afterlife tokens from Seraph of the Scales, which don't naturally have Lifelink otherwise. And Seraph is the final 4-drop in the deck, which we could play more copies, as a 4-mana 4-3 flyer that can gain Vigilance and or Death Touch, and when it dies it leaves behind two Flying Spirit tokens. And finally at 5 mana, another addition from War of the Spark, God Eternal Bontu, a 5-6 with Menace. It's a god from War of the Spark, so when it dies or is put into exile from the battlefield, we can choose to put it 3rd from the top in our library. And when Bontu enters the battlefield, we can sacrifice any number of other permanents and then draw that many cards. So we can also sacrifice our lands, so in the late game if we're flooding out a bit, we can just sacrifice our lands, maybe keep like 4 or 5, and then draw a ton of cards. And of course also synergizes very nicely with cards like Cruel Celebrant and Midnight. Night Reaper rewarding us for sacrificing those creatures as well. And then a 5-6 Menace can also take over the board. 
that's just a very powerful creature. And then mana base is very straightforward, 7 planes, 9 swamps, 4 godless shrine and 4 isolated chapel. So this is the black white version of the deck. Now let's take a look at the differences with the Mardu build. It's pretty similar, at 1 mana instead of Hunted Witness, we've got the full 4 copies of Footlight Fiend instead, as a nice 1-drop multicolor creature that when it dies deals 1 damage to any target, which also synergizes with our 1 copy of Tessa. Then instead of Dusk Legion Zealot, we've got a full playset of Hero of Precinct 1, since we've got more multicolor cards in this deck, and the hero generates a 1-1 token whenever we cast a multicolor spell. We've got the 4 copies of Footlight Fiend, as well as the full 4 copies of Judith, the Scorch Diva, which are the new additions that are multicolor to trigger the hero, and Judith of course is the main reason why we're playing red. Other creatures we control get plus 1 plus 0, which is a nice little anthem effect, and then whenever a non-token creature we control dies, Judith deals 1 damage to any target, so that damage can definitely add up and make combat math very tricky for our opponent, and also rewards us for sacrificing creatures, since now we get to deal additional damage as well. That damage also gets amplified by Tessa, and Soren also makes that damage gain life, so we can gain a ton of life with Judith as well. So just an excellent creature in this archetype, and also plays pretty well with Hero, since all those tokens will get plus 1 plus 0. They don't deal damage when they die with Judith, since it's only non-tokens, and also doesn't draw cards with the Midnight Reaper, since it's only non-tokens, but still provides a ton of sacrifice fodder for the deck. Then at 2 mana we don't have any other differences. We don't have the 2 copies of Spark Harvest that we had in the black-white version, since we don't have Hunted Witness at 1 mana as a nice sacrifice target, and with all the damage from Footlight, Fiend and Judith, we don't really have the need for as much removal, because we can just deal additional damage and uh, take out Planeswalkers that way as well. And then we only have room for 2 copies of Midnight Reaper instead of the full playset, since of course we're also playing 4 copies of Judith at 3 mana. Still have our 2 copies of Mortify, which also plays well with Hero Precinct 1, and then at 4 mana everything stays the same, and we also have the 2 copies of God Eternal Bond 2, which also plays well with Hero of Precinct 1. Then the mana base is a bit more complicated, since we need to add in some red mana as well. Got 3 swamps, all the black-white dual lands, then 4 copies of Blood Crypt, 2 Dragon Skull Summit, 3 Clifftop Retreats, and 4 copies of Sacred Foundry. We will start with the black-white version, and then try out Mordu as well, so let's jump in some games and see how the decks do. Alright, we're on the play with a decent looking hand, no one drop creature to lead with, but I'm still gonna keep. And then turn 2, probably play the Priest of Forgotten Gods, hoping to draw into a one drop so we can go Cruel Celebrant plus one drop and have the option of sacrificing some stuff if we want to. Opponent on the red green. So if they can't kill the Priest, it's gonna be pretty effective. But it looks like the Priest is gonna eat a Lava Coil, it's too bad. At least it's a Lava Coil that's not killing the Seraph. So not the most explosive start on our side here. Just a Cruel Celebrant for now, which doesn't do much by itself, but pretty important once we start sacrificing some creatures. Bone makes a 3-3 Zerta Goblin. Alright, land means we get to run out of 4-drop. And I think we'll lead with the uh, Seraph here and then hope they don't have a second Lava Coil. This is where having a way to sacrifice a Seraph in response to a Lava Coil would be nice. So it doesn't get exiled and we can maybe get it back with Sorin. And also get those 1-1 Spirit Tokens instead of... nothing. Alright, 4th land. And it's gonna be another Zerta Goblin into another 2-drop. Alright, Domri's Ambush to kill our Celebrant. And the Zorta attacks. I don't mind trading here. Always have Soren to get back stuff from the graveyard. Hunted Witness was actually a pretty good pickup. Now we could play Hunted Witness, Celebrant and a Spark Harvest to kill the Goblin. Don't know if the Goblin's such a threat that we need to use our Spark Harvest on it. I don't think it is. So how about we just play Soren? And then, I don't want a minus four, so I think I'm just gonna plus for now. So we preserve some loyalty, and just attack with one spirit token, leaving the other back to chum block. To protect our Sorin, and the next turn we can maybe minus four, get back Seraph, play some more stuff out from our hand. Crawl Harpooner can kill our spirit, sadly. So hopefully no lightning strike to finish off our Sorin here. The goblin does go after Soren. 
And another Harpooner, killing our other spirit token. So leaving back both spirits would not have saved us here. Alright, so we can no longer get back Seraph with Surin, but we can play out a bunch of creatures here. We'll start with the Zealot, see what we draw. Vontu, alright, that's a nice one to work towards. So, do we want to Spark Harvest something? Opponent does have quite a bit of pressure in play now, so I don't mind it. And then maybe get back a Celebrant instead of plusing Surin. So we get our value while we can. Get back Celebrant. Play a Hunted Witness. Spark Harvest. Sacrificing. Could also sacrifice Surin himself, but we want to try and protect him here. So we'll kill the Zurta, sacking the Witness. Get a 1-1 one, one and drain the opponent for 1. Alright, so we've got a bunch of options for next turn, depending on whether or not we draw land. Reveler. Opponent gets to discard and draw. Discarding another Reveler. So opponent probably splashing black as well. So they can use that spectacle every now and then. Harpooners go after Sorin. So we could trade and then chump, or we could double chump. Could also let Sorin go. I think I'm okay with a trade and a chump here. Pick up a land. So now we get to plus Sorin. Play a Bontu. And I think I'm okay sacrificing two lands here. And I've got a 5-6 to protect our Surin. So if they don't have any haste creatures or burn spells, Surin should survive. Alright, Spellbreaker has a haster. So they're probably gonna try and kill Surin. But we get to take out... Spellbreaker, I think, is more threatening than the Harpooner. Alright. And now we get to re-establish a board with the Reaper. We've got a pretty big life total advantage. So I don't mind attacking for 5. Next turn we can play a Celebrant and maybe Spark Harvest something. So all that life draining with the Cruel Celebrants definitely added up. Another Zerta Goblin. So we can play out our entire hand here. Make it so our opponents can no longer block our uh, Bontu very easily. And our opponent's just going to concede, since they're forced to double chump or Bontu to not die, so they weren't winning that game. Alright, we're on the play with a solid opening hand. Witness into Zealoth into Reaper, hope to draw some sack outlets. Let's get in for one. Second Reaper, good to have a backup. One card we would not like to face is a Crowd of Carnarium, since that card pretty much wipes the floor with our entire deck. Doesn't matter for Black, White or Mardu, that card is backbreaking to the archetype. Instead it's going to be a turn to Lasso Tap Reaper. Sir Point might also have some sacrifice synergies going on. We're just going to play Reaper. Reaver can definitely be a nice addition too, instead of something like a Zealot providing two bodies instead of just one. But of course getting to draw a card is pretty valuable too. When you need to draw a certain amount of key cards, opponent's got their own Reaper, so we've got a bit of a mirror match on our hands. I think I'm just playing the Gutter Bones. Don't really want to attack with the Reaper, otherwise they get to block with the Reaper and a zombie token, which doesn't seem too useful. More Lasso Tap Reavers. So we've got a Ground Stall. 
Dreadhorde Invasion, alright, so that's gonna help them grow their zombie, or we could just kill it with our Mortify, which we could consider. Could also consider making some aggressive attacks here, and then maybe killing the Midnight Reaper before damage, so they only get to draw the one card instead of multiples. Killing the Invasion could be safer though, since once they start getting a 6-6 in play, it's gonna be difficult to beat. Yeah, let's just kill it right now. And now we're waiting for something like a Priest, something like a Seraph, a Sorin, even a Cruel Celebrant would make our attacks more profitable. Alright, opponents playing blue as well, so they were missing blue for a while, but plays it tapped. More gutter bones. I guess we'll uh, get in there with our own gutter bones, since if they trade we get to draw two cards and they only get to draw one. And empty your hand. Not playing around a sweeper. Since uh, if your opponent's playing Midnight Reapers and Lasso Tap Reavers, I don't think they'll have too much in the way of sweeper effects themselves. They might enter the God of Thrones here on our Midnight Reaper, but we'll get to draw two cards. Spark Harvests and Planes. Alright. So we've got a ton of Sacrifice Fodder, just waiting for a good sack outlet. Let's kill the Midnight Reaper here, I think, instead of the 6-6. Of course, if they draw another Invasion, we might regret not killing the 6-6. But I think the Reaper in general is going to be scarier. And I actively want to sacrifice a creature here, we can sack a Gutter Bones. Right, Celebrants. No attacks. Their own Gutter Bones. And a Liliana. Fair enough. If I were you, I'd just surrender. Well, we already like used... One of our Spark Harvests to deal with the Planeswalker. We've got one more in the deck, otherwise it's gonna be combat damage to try and kill Liliana. So what happens if we send all the random creatures at Liliana here? If our opponent makes some blocks, then we get to draw a bunch of cards, we get to drain with the Celebrant, so it's not that bad. So all at Liliana, except for Celebrant and Reaper. Could also be reasonable to go face to try and drain them out with the Celebrant. But we'll try this for now. Alright. Just a one trade. Not the best set of draws so far. Our entire playset of Hunted Witness in play. Liliana down to two, so we don't have to fear the ultimates for a while here. Overseer. So now their token has Menace and Hexproof. Priest is a good draw. Do we want to make some crazy attacks here? Opponent's got six blockers, seven, eight, nine attackers. So we should be able to kill Liliana if we send all the random creatures at Liliana here. Yeah, let's do it. Opponent can draw some cards as well from their creatures dying, but getting Liliana off the board seems pretty important. And with every creature that dies, we get to drain them for one and draw a card. Now if they kill the Midnight Reaper before damage, we're gonna be sad. Alright. So Liliana down. Ton of triggers on the stack. Opponent draws two. Gets drained for a bunch. And now we get to draw some cards. Bontu is looking good. 
if we had a second Celebrant, we might have been able to kill our opponent right now by playing second Celebrant and then sacking everything to Bontu. Alright, opponent's gonna concede anyway. Just drew too many cards too far ahead. On to the next one. Alright, we're on the play with a reasonable looking hand. Although sadly we can't uh, play the Witness on turn 1. There's a play in the turn late. Um, do we want to play the Pontiff? Playing Pontiff without being able to sack anything in response to protect it from removal might be bad. So I think I'm leading with the Zealots. And then next turn we have a few options. We can play Pontiff, keep up one mana. Or we can just uh, play out both creatures here. Opponent with a Cruel Celebrant and opponents on the Mardu build of the deck. So we'll see how the mirror plays out here. I think I'm okay playing Pontiff and then playing a Witness. They're not gonna have a ton of targeted removal for the Pontiff. Hero Pissing Twan into a Footlight Fiend. Alright. And now, do we want to Spark Harvest the hero, or do we keep Spark Harvest for something else? Kind of want to just play the Soren here. And keep Spark Harvest for, like, a Judith. Everything at Sorin, so we can make some trades. Sorin still at three. If we Spark Harvest the Judith, then Surin dies if we get back a 2-drop here. So we probably either get back a 1-drop or plus Surin. I'm leaning towards just plusing. And then I guess we'll sack the Witness instead of the lifelinking token. I'll probably take out a token here. Second Judith would be unfortunate, instead it's a Sorin getting back Judith. It's pretty good. So we can trade. And drawing lands is not going to help. Well, we do get to take out Soren at least. <laughs> what a mess I made. So what draws can save us here? Bontu could be pretty good. Dreadhorde Butcher, that's an interesting one. Pretty good when we don't have any blockers in play, of course. And a Celebrant all by herself is not gonna do much here, so it looks like the Mardu build is gonna be victorious over the black-white one. Although our draw was not particularly amazing, didn't draw any of our card draw engines, no Reapers, Bontus or Priests. Whereas the opponent had a pretty good draw, I think. And the Fiend and Judith finishes off. Alright, on to the next one. Alright, we're playing the Mardu build now and we're on the play with a decent looking hand. Turn on Gutter Bones, turn 2 Hero.
I guess we should have considered playing the Godless Shrine in case we pick up a, uh, a check land that's not white. Then we could have uh, saved ourselves two life to play the hero here. Let's just attack. Opponent with an Arboreal Grazer, turn two. Some, some sort of a ramp deck. Don't really want to mortify that, but I will take two in case we need to kill something else. And then hope to draw some lands. Alright, Fine Mare, that one we can kill. So are we killing Grazer anyway here? I think we hold the Mortify. Alright, play another hero first to get some value. Not sure what type of deck our opponent's playing. Are they gonna try and put a Blanchwood armor on their Vine Mare? Who knows? Take five for now. And Biogenic Ooze. Now with that we definitely do wanna kill. Before it gets out of hand. And now we've got some blockers for the Vine Mare. Since, of course, Gutter Bones can block the Vine Mare. Hitting our land drops. So if they try and race, Soren's gonna help us out. Probably gonna start by playing the Seraph, and then once we have the Seraph in play, we can play Soren so we can fly over and gain four. Put on those sand. Yeah, I think I'm okay blocking the Vine Mare. And losing a hero. Don't think we block with more than this. Don't expect a ton of combat tricks. And we'll take three from the Ooze token. Could also block with Gutter Bones and the Soldier token, I guess. Maybe that's not so bad. Just make some trades. So if we're not under any pressure, we could also play Soren, get back hero, which is a nice value play. Depends if they add something that can attack our Sorin here. Alright, it's gonna be a Wayward Swordtooth. Into another Grazer. They've got one card remaining, but seven lands, so... If they've got something like an Ugin, a Nissa, Things could get scary. So because of that, I think I like playing the Seraph, which can at least help us pressure a Planeswalker, even though the Grazers do have reach, so they can jump in front of the Seraph. Seraph gaining Death Touch could also trade for the Swordtooth. Or we could play a Soren, get back Hero to start making some more Chum Blockers on the ground first. Which also plays well with our Bontu. It's kinda close here. I guess we'll play Soren. And get back Hero. I did not stop this fight, but I will finish it. And then we get to play our land tapped. So we don't have to take two more damage in order to keep up Death Touch. And we can maybe play that next turn. And then make some more tokens before playing Bontu to draw a bunch of cards. And hope they don't have any powerful top end threat here. Ooh, finale for five. What does that get? Another ooze maybe? Yep. Ooze is pretty good here since they can sink a lot of mana into it and we don't have a spot removal spell for it lined up. We'll just chump the sword tooth for now. More Bontus. Think we still play Seraph first and then just plus for now. I my All right, so this ooze is definitely an issue. Hopefully Bontu can draw us into a removal spell for the ooze. Although we don't have as many spot removal spells as a black-white version, since we rely more on Judith and Footlight Fiends dealing damage to kill stuff, which doesn't really help against big creatures like Ooze and Surtooth. So I'm okay trading Seraph for the Surtooth. Question is, do we want to trade a hero for an Ooze? Considering we can get back hero with Soren, I don't hate it. And then just double block like this, since they only get to kill one hero. 
And make sure to give this death touch. So got a lot of sacrifice fodder for Bontu. Fine mare, that's fine. And a priest. Of course they do have those grazers they can sacrifice still. I think the play is going to be to get back hero, play Bontu and then sacrifice all the 1-1s one -ones and maybe a land. Not sure why the spirit tokens aren't actually flying, but they do have flying. Don't have to mine a Soren first, but I'm going to do it anyway. Can maybe keep one token to chum the Vine Mare since we can block with Bontu. I guess that's reasonable. Alright. Play our land for the turn. No attacks. So no real removal spell for the Ooze yet, but we've got some more cards to work with. Ooh, Ugin. Goes after Soren first. Lander Elves. So we'll start by playing Judith to pump our team. And we'll send Bontu at Ugin. Since I don't really want to sacrifice a an actual creature to deal the one damage to Ugin, since Judith doesn't trigger off tokens. And we'll see whether another opponent wants to make some blocks. Blocks with two grazers, that's fine. So now they have fewer creatures to sacrifice to the priest. Now we could play Pontiff, sack one of our creatures to finish off Ugin. That's probably what we want to do before playing the priest. Of course the issue is... We cannot sacrifice a token to finish off Ugin, so we'll have to sack something else. Could just sack Bontu since we have another one coming up. Don't hit it. Probably should have done this in the opponent's uh, upkeep, so that Bontiff would have Death Touch during the opponent's turn. But of course before... Letting the opponent activate their Planeswalker. But I doubt they will be attacking here. Right, just make some ooze tokens with the Biogenic Ooze. Footlined Fiend to draw. So we get to make a few more tokens and play another Bontu here, I think. And how much do we sacrifice at least one land and probably like four tokens. All right. And I'll take two to play another Footlight Fiend. And then next turn we can just play a bunch of Celebrants and then set up for lethal. Don't even have to win by attacking here, just uh, drains from the celebrants should be enough. So I just play celebrants. Could have tapped our mana a bit better here to leave up more black, since now we're unable to play out our hands. Not sure why the auto tapper decided to tap those, but oh well. Just say go for now. Could attack, no reason to. Next turn just play Bond to sacrifice our entire board. And Celebrant will do the rest. Alright.
This is a Judith trigger. Some Soulburn triggers. And then Bontu goes back and now we get to sacrifice our entire board here. All right, this should be enough. Bam, sweet, on to the next one. All right, we're on the play with a nice hands, double hero, celebrant and Surin as multicolor cards and a good solid mana base. Well, let's see what we're up against. Turn on Mountain, so it could be Mono Red. They had a slight pause, so I'm expecting a shock. Don't really want the hero to get shocked, but it's probably still the play. And then next turn we'll run out the second hero before playing out the multicolor stuff. Alright, red green and a growth chamber guardian. Fair enough. So we'll be able to make a bunch of tokens soon. Have the option of playing two Celebrants or a Sorin, never mind. Lightning Strike takes out our second hero. Playing Sorin and minusing to get back heroes is pretty sketchy now, since then they can finish off our Sorin. So not a great spot for us to be in. Would love to have like an extra creature in play to chum block with, but if we play out both celebrants, then we lose out on all the hero value. So yeah, them having those two removal spells was pretty annoying. We could also play Soren and Plus, because then they're unable to kill Soren even if they adapt. But a one loyalty Soren also doesn't do much for us. So it could be worth it to get back our hero regardless. Yeah, I think so. And then hopefully next turn we get to make some tokens. Mobilize District. Probably implies they've got some Domries in there. And yep, there's Anarch of Bolas. So they're probably just gonna fight with the Lanner Elves now to kill our hero. And we'll be left with not a whole lot. Since now Sorin dies, we don't get to make any tokens with these celebrants. And yeah, we're in trouble. I think the Mardu version, more than the black white version, relies on momentum to uh, stay ahead. Cards like Hero are really good if you can make a bunch of tokens, but of course. If we were to draw a hero now, it's just a 2 mana 2-2. Two -two. A Legion War Boss. A Legion War Boss pretty good alongside Domri here, since Token's now a 2-1. Can't simply block it with the Cruel Celebrant. So yeah, I don't like our chances. Need like a Bontu of the top. Judith isn't bad. So do we send both Celebrants at Domri, or just one? Probably just one. I'll play out my land in case we draw Bontu, since then we want to sack lands and maybe be able to play a land afterwards. Another Domri. Explains why they were okay letting the first one go. Now they can fight Judith with a Growth Chamber Guardian. We get to take out Domri, but we're still facing a Growth Chamber Guardian and a Legion War Boss. <laughs> That's the sound of a stampede coming straight at ya. But the War Boss is just gonna start attacking and they get to mentor.
All right, so we'll take eight. Bontu or bust. Blood crypt instead. All right, GG's. So yeah, this game kind of boiled down to those removal spells for the heroes. If we get to stick a hero and then make a bunch of tokens, we can protect our Surin, and then once Judith comes down, those tokens are pretty scary. But a few key removal spells to dismantle or draw. Alright, GG's. Alright, we're on the draw with a nice hand if the hero survives, which is a pretty big if, but one can hope. And then Triple Celebrant plus Tessa is pretty strong too, doubling up on those death triggers. Turn one mountain. So it could be the mono red deck, in which case the hero is probably not going to survive. Our opponent appears to have a shock in hand, which they're going to hold on to. Alright, so, so blue red control. Don't love running out the hero into a pretty obvious shock, so I guess we'll lead with the pontiff. Which will probably still eat the removal spell here. And then next turn we can play the hero. Third land untapped for a counter spell. Presumably. Um, I guess we could bait with the celebrants. Pretty important that this hero sticks around. They might let this resolve, but they would definitely counter the hero. Alright, Ionize counters the celebrants, so. If we draw land next turn, we can double spell, hopefully go hero into a celebrant, make a token. Otherwise, we could just play the Reaper. Augur of Bolas. What does it find? Finds an opt. And they're gonna fire it off. Alright, so now is the window to resolve our hero. And a retreat. So we get to make our token right away. Before they get to kill the hero. Looks like they picked up another shock. But we will get our token. They probably want to kill the hero before the Celebrant enters the battlefield, so they don't get drained for one. Could have considered running out Midnight Reaper first, so that uh, at least we get to draw a card when they kill our creature. Ral's Outburst on the Celebrant now too, so they're kind of dismantling our entire draw here, killing our creatures one by one. I need a Surin to get back into it. Augur's even attacking. Alright, I guess we get to double spell pretty nicely here. On the bright side, an Izzet control deck is not going to have any Cry of the Carnariums, which is a sweeper we're afraid of. Rekindling Phoenix, pretty good threat. Can't exile it. Can hope to maybe kill it with a Judith ping or a Footlight Fiend ping once it turns into an egg. Alright, Seraph. Pretty decent here too. Do they have a third shock? Looks like it. Maybe another opt. They're probably just shocking the Reaper here if they have one. And then we get uh, Taisa, which can also help us make more tokens with the Seraph if it dies. Alright, they're just shocking our face. That's very aggressive. Outburst on the Seraph. Sadly, don't get uh, Taisa value, but the tokens will still have lifelink once we play Taisa. So I'm okay for opponents attacks us with the Phoenix here. Augur attacks too. It's a little suspicious. 
Do they have some one damage effect, maybe? For all our creatures, I doubt it. We'll block. Alright, that was a strange attack with Augur. And yeah, the lifelink on Taisa is going to be pretty relevant here. Opponent down to 8, and now playing the Celebrant with the Taisa in play is going to be quite strong. Opponent's got 2 cards in hand, 7 mana to work with. Opponent says go, Judith to pick up might just be better than playing a Celebrant here. Let's see if they have another counter spell. Maybe a Fairy Cannonade as their sweeper. But that would still deal quite a bit of damage. I think we're sending. Could be a mistake to send Taisa if they have a Cannonade here. Yeah, we'll do this. Alright, just an explosion for three on Judith. So we'll deal one to them. Another one to them. And we get to draw two cards from the Reaper, thanks to Taisa. And then they get to block the Reaper. Take five down to one. Seems good to me. Draw two more cards. And then I think I'll just play Gutter Bones. We could take two to play a Celebrant. But I uh, don't want to get burnt out somehow. Yeah, that shock going to her face was very questionable. Otherwise, they might have still been in the game. Opponent is playing Ralstorm Conduit, so they do have the infinite combo in their deck with Expansion Explosion. Copying another Expansion Explosion. But uh, they don't have the mana to pull it off here. Alright, sweet, so we got to see Taisa in action, giving our tokens lifelink, dealing more damage with Judith, drawing more cards with the Reaper. All good things. Alright, so in summary, Mardu versus Black White. I think the Mardu deck has a higher ceiling with cards like Hero. If they go unanswered, can be very strong. And of course plays well alongside Judith. There is of course a bit more inconsistency with the mana base sometimes. And if they can pick off a card like Hero or Judith, You've got less card draw since you've got fewer copies of Reaper, you don't have the Dusk Legion Zealot that replaces itself. So the deck is a bit more momentum based than the Black White version that can maybe recover from sweepers a bit better. So I would say that the ceiling on the Mardu version is higher, but I think the floor is also lower on the Mardu version as opposed to the Black White one, which is a little bit more consistent, but doesn't have as many explosive draws as the Mardu version, which can get out of hand with Hero. So both versions definitely have their merit, but I've been very impressed with the addition of God Eternal Bontu to the archetype, giving us an extra card draw engine that can also finish out the game alongside Cruel Celebrants. Alright, so that's going to be it for me today. I want to thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed, and as always, have a nice day. I also want to thank all my patrons for being part of the channel, and you can become a patron yourself today and decide the topic of future videos over at patreon.com forward slash legendvd.